Good morning. How are you? My name is Kert and I will be joining this stream today from my home in Binfield. I don't know where you are, but I'm glad you're with us. Whether you are a regular member of our community or you might be a guest, a virtual guest this time. Welcome. Today's program will feature a number of exciting items, um, many wonderful thoughts and a good load of pretty decent challenges for our day-to-day -day lives. We hope you find encouragement, you find people who think like you, and we hope that you find the community that can be there for you during these strange times. In order to get yourself ready, I would like you to first of all make sure that all the children have their drawing gear set up. So go now and find your pencils, your pens, your, your crayons and a bit of paper. You will be needing that later today. For everyone, I would like to challenge you to report in from where you are. It would be wonderful if during the service you would take a selfie or a group selfie of you and your family joining us in worship. You will see an email address to which you can send this picture so that we would get a sense of what our community and what our worship looked like in your homes today. It would be a wonderful to be able to get a glimpse into who is out there and who with we are joined together in worship today. Before we start though, I would like to ask you a question and I would like to get a serious, genuine answer. How are you? It's a question we often ask but not so often really truly think about. Do a bit of soul searching, test your hearts. How are you? Some of us might know exactly. We're a little anxious, we're a little worried perhaps for our own sake, perhaps for our friends or our relatives. We might be turning slightly a hypochondriac these days because any scratch in our throats or any tiny little cough or shiver down our spine might be a symptom that the thing is coming. We might be thinking that we're perfectly fine. We might be going about our busy lives that have just turned even busier and not even realize that deep down in our hearts there are concerns and worries. The first song we would like to sing with you this morning addresses precisely those moments. The times when we don't know, we need to be reminded of the fact that under his wings we can find the peace even in the midst of the craziest of events in our lives. Thank you for joining us for this worship. Thank you for singing along. And thank you for thinking along, because singing that song will remind us where to find our anchor and how to regain the peace in our hearts. Thank you. 
As we are studying the Church Without Walls, we came to the Book of Acts. You know that the Book of Acts is describing how the Holy Spirit established the Christian Church. So as we come to Acts chapter 1, we see that after 10 days of quarantine, the Holy Spirit started something exceptional and new in the midst of the remaining disciples. He enabled a fisherman called Peter to present the gospel to those people who were in Jerusalem. Basically, what Peter presented was a sermon with about six parts. He started saying that Jesus was a man divinely attested by miracles. And then he moved on and he said he was put to death by our wicked hands. He was then raised from the dead and he was exalted to God's right hand. From there, he pulled out the Holy Spirit to us. Then Jesus now gives forgiveness to those who repent and are baptized. And lastly, Peter said that Jesus adds people to his new community. 3,000 people were baptized that day when Peter preached. The passage, what we are about to study from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, talks about these people. There are four characteristics of the Spirit-led church. The first one, that this church was a learning church. As we read in the Bible, they devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles. The Holy Spirit opened a school where the apostles were the teachers, and there were 3,000 students to which God added more and more daily. So we shouldn't imagine that the disciples said to themselves, okay, Peter, you are taking systematic theology. Matthew, you are taking Old Testament. John, you are taking the Gospels and prophecy. Nothing like that. The apostles started teaching these people because they knew that whatever they heard from Jesus was true. And then most probably they told stories to these people and also the Holy Spirit reminded them of the teachings of Jesus. So anti-intellectualism and the fullness of the Spirit are mutually incompatible. The Holy Spirit is helping us to learn more and more about Jesus. The second characteristic of a Spirit-led church is that it was a loving church. We read from the Bible that they devoted themselves to the fellowship. This is the Greek word koinonia, and this bears witness to the common life of the church in two senses. It expresses that we share together in our beliefs God, God himself. Our fellowship is with the Father, with the Son, Jesus Christ, and also with the Holy Spirit. But also, this loving church shared something else. Whatever they had in common, they wanted to share among each other. So the koinonikos word in Greek means to be generous. They shared what they had. And in this lockdown situation, most probably we are going to learn what does this mean. So if you have a kilogram of sugar and your neighbor doesn't have any, so you are going to share. Some of the disciples shared even property, even what they had, they possessed. And this sharing was voluntary. Remember that they met in houses in those times. So not everyone sold their house because that's how they kept meeting in houses as they fellowshiped together. Now, the third characteristic is that they worshipped together. It was a worshipping church. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and prayer. Children, I would like you to pay attention because very soon I'm going to give you a little bit of assignment that I would like you to draw how we are doing these four aspects of church at Newbold Church. So those people in the first church, they ate together, they had the Lord's Supper together, and they prayed together, as we read from the Bible. At the beginning, they met in the temple courts and also in houses. Later, after the destruction of the temple, they met in the houses only. Reverence and joy were present all the way through as they worshipped. 
and that resulted that everyone was filled with awe, both believers and unbelievers. And that's how worship is actually reaching its target. It was also an evangelistic church, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Those Christians were not so preoccupied with learning, sharing, and worshiping that they forgot about witnessing. No. And this witnessing was done and was helped by the Lord Jesus Christ, because the Lord added to their number. The Lord added those who were being saved. Because Jesus wanted to stress this, that belonging to his church and salvation, they belong together. And also the Lord added people daily and he kept adding them. So this is exactly our experience during these days. So again, children, I would like you to divide a blank sheet of paper in four equal parts. Draw our church as we learn in the left-hand side corner, as we love each other next to it. And in the bottom, I would like you to draw how we worship together and how we share God with others. And then please email your drawing to us and we are going to feature them next week. Now, for the adults, we have prepared a few questions for discussion. You can discuss these in your family setting, or you can call a friend. And you can discuss these questions, what we are going to put up on the screen, and you can see that these four questions relate to how we do church in this lockdown situation as we are forced to do it by the coronavirus situation. God bless you.
Listen up, children. It's time for the children's story. Good morning, boys and girls, and thank you very much for joining us this morning. The main character of our story is a little girl by the name of Hannah. And I came downstairs where mum was in the lounge. And she asked my mum, do you love my hair? And mum said, yes, I certainly do. What if I were to arrange it in a ponytail? Do you still love it? And mum said, look, it does not really matter how you arrange it. I will always love you. Because for me, it does not matter what color or what length or what shape your hair is. It is what's in your heart that matters the most. And she said, what if I were to tie it right up here? Do you still love me? And mummy said, yes, I absolutely love you. And I said, mommy, I've been praying. I've been praying to God and I've been wanting to do something for him. I have prayed to God and I don't quite know what it is, but I want to do something to share the love of God with those around me. Mommy said, look, you are already doing that. Hannah said, when do I do that? He said, well, every time I ask you to do something and you do it willingly, I know that God is in your heart and you do what God wants you to do. I know every time you say please and thank you, God is part of your life. And I'm very grateful for that. God is already working in your life. And he said, yeah, but I want to do something even more special. Hmm. Mom thought, I reckon you have an idea already. Hannah said, yeah, I do. One day I was watching a children's television program. And I saw the presenter there encouraging people to donate, to give their hair in order to be made into wigs for people who are ill and their hair falls out. It is here in the United Kingdom. It's called the Little Princess Trust. And she said, while I was watching the program, I thought, I have beautiful blonde hair. I wonder should I give my hair to be made into a wig for somebody else, for another child? And mom said, look, if God puts it on your heart, you will know it. Well, how do you feel about it? I said, well, I'm really nervous. I'm not quite sure. Well, mommy said, no problem with not being sure. Why don't you pray about it and see if God convinces you in your heart that this is the right thing to do? And I said, okay no problem. Next day, she woke up, she prayed to God, and she said, God, I want to do something special for you. Is this the right thing? She wasn't quite convinced by the end of the day, so I said, all right, I'll pray tomorrow. And she did. For a couple of days, Hannah prayed every day, and she said, God, what is it that you want me to do? I want to do something special for you. One day she was watching the same television program when the presenter was introducing that same initiative, uh, donating your hair, especially if it is longer than 30 centimeters, that's about 10 inches, that's about the height of a, of a piece of paper. She said, if you do have hair that's longer than that, we can use it to turn it into a wig for a child with no hair. She prayed again while the program was on, she prayed, and she had some peace in her heart she could not explain. She called mommy and said, Mom, I think I know what God wants me to do. He wants me to give my hair for other children to have wigs. Good. If God puts it on your heart, let's call the producer. They called the producer. They arranged the day. On the day, they traveled to the studio. And there she was getting ready to go on the stage. She was very nervous. They prayed again with mom and they asked God, if this is your thing, if this is you wanting me to do something for you, give me the courage and the strength. And sure enough, they went on the stage. She was still a little bit uncertain, but uh, the presenter was very nice and very calm. And she talked to her and she talked to the audience into the camera. And before she knew it, the presenter took the scissors, went behind her, held her hair in her hand and snip, snip. That was it. Her beautiful, long, blonde hair, gone in a second. She took the, pony, uh, the, the ponytail, the, the, the hair, the bunch of hair, she put it on Hannah's lap, and there she saw it. Oh, my long hair is gone. And then the presenter got busy arranging her hair. More snip, snip. 
more coming, more snip snip. When the presenter was done, she gave her a, she gave Hannah a, a, a mirror. She looked in there and was like, "Ooh, I like me this way too." Actually, everybody in the studio was super impressed with the way in which Hannah looked, even with short hair now. And on top of it all, she actually donated that long, beautiful blonde hair for somebody else to have a wig. She came out of the studio and on their way home in the car, she said, Mommy, I was a wee bit scared at the beginning, but now I feel so much better knowing that I've done what God wants me to do, to share his love with those around me. And mom said, look, I'm not surprised because God said, I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. I'll never abandon you. I will always be there with you to give you strength to do that which is right, to love other people. Just before they got home, Hannah said, Mommy, I really enjoyed this experience, even though I wasn't sure at the beginning. I actually want to do even more and greater things for God. Mommy could only encourage her. Because you see, boys and girls, we are not here in this life just for us. We are here to live for others, to do good for others, to bless them, to share the love of God with those around us. Last week, I encouraged you to belong to the Do Good Club. I look forward to hearing stories of what you are doing to do good to others. This week, I encourage you to let the love of God, which is in your heart, just pour out in doing things, good things for others. Please share those stories with us because we'd like to share them with the rest of our audience. Thank you for loving God and thank you for sharing him with others. Let us pray together. Dear God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your love for our children. May it overflow into loving others, we pray, for our boys and girls, in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't it wonderful that as Christians we are called to live two realities at once? Two realities that are not distant from each other, they're intertwined and, and mixed with each other, and yet when the here and now gets crazy in ways we've never expected, we can think of the big picture and remind ourselves where we find our point of departure, the place that holds us together, the, the knowledge that gives us strength to carry on, and the feeling of God's touch that gives us hope. It doesn't matter whether you are yearning for human touch and engagement in your loneliness, in, in the strange circumstances of living confined to your four walls. Or maybe you're going crazy at home because you just can't find a space or the time to find a moment for yourself. It doesn't matter what your daily reality is. We can all sing this next song, Jesus paid it all. And in the end, in the big picture, he's got us covered. I hear the Saviour say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray.
The current COVID-19 crisis reminds me that we're all connected. Something that is affecting you is affecting me too. Each person has an effect on another. During this period of social distancing, isolation and protection, necessary for the prevention of the spread of the virus, protecting the NHS and saving lives, it makes me reflect on the plight of people who experience constant isolation oppression and fear. This crisis gives us all an important opportunity, more than ever before, to care for one another. Let's reach out, do what we can to support one another. A phone call, an offer of support or a text message. Let's remember that no social distancing or isolation can separate us from our connection with God. Join us as we care for one another through prayer. We're all in this together. So please share your prayer requests by text, phone or email. Thank you. A well-known author says that prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. That's what we're going to do today. So feel free to bow your heads and close your eyes if that's what works for you when you pray. But you might choose to do something a little different today. Perhaps keep your eyes open and visually include the members of your family as we pray. Take time to look one another in the eyes while joining your silent prayers for each person with the prayer that I will lead. Are you ready? Then let's pray. Good morning, Lord. This is the second Sabbath of our national lockdown and things are certainly different. We're locked out of so much of what is familiar and regular in our lives. We're working from home, schooling from home, worshipping from home, and missing so many of the things that we have taken for granted. Sabbath feels a little different for us. And once again, we're gathered around our television and computer screens seeking connection and community in a time of self-isolation and social distancing. It feels foreign and strange to us, we who are accustomed to handshakes, to hugs and kisses, as expressions of affection, of friendship and of family. We sense that we should come out of this experience different in some way, better, more than bitter, bonded together, more than broken apart, with believing hearts more than with barren souls. We've lost our regular routines, our lives are upended. It feels strange to say this, but thank you for that. Help us to find the blessing in discovering new ways of being, ways that are slower, deliberate, intentional. Thank you for time. Time to devote to the things we have often glossed over, as we try to fit it all in. Time for deep and meaningful conversations and for time for silliness, for board games, for walks and for books, for devotions and for prayer. Thank you for our neighbours with whom we share this strange experience, for narrowing our focus to the street on which we live, the people around us, the community that exists unseen and often unappreciated. The people you have given us to and who are given to us. You are the one who is able to bring beauty from ashes. Bring, we pray, from our enforced isolation a new community, compassionate, vibrant, whole and wholesome. We wish to take time to pray for our national and denominational leaders. Grant to them, we pray, wise counsellors and listening ears. Bless them with an abundance of insight and with hearts that are turned and tuned for all the people of this country. We pray for those who serve faithfully in the service and health sectors, who are 
working long hours and are in harm's way. We have often taken their service and their sacrifice for granted. Of you and from them we ask forgiveness. While we understand that we live in a world infected with sin and fraught with dangers because of it, provide for them a hedge of protection and a tower of strength as they serve the people of this nation faithfully and with integrity. Lord, all of these matters, and indeed all that matters, we place in your hands, trusting that yours are the safest pair of hands we know. Truly, you have the whole world in those hands, the, the tiny babies, the elderly, the immune compromised, those with underlying health conditions, the healthy and the whole, the hurting and the stressed. All that has been and all that will be is known to you. So lead us, we pray, step by step through this crisis time and ultimately into the future that you have in mind for us. Keep us. Preserve us. Save us. In all things may we declare, your will be done. So be it. Amen. Things are changing around us at an unprecedented speed, and they leave us very worried. The world appears to be closing in on us, and before we realize, we're under complete lockdown, which is nerving, not least because very few of us, if any, have ever experienced such circumstances. The plague, which is making its way around the world right now, is drawing closer and closer to our friends and family members, some of whom are already infected and some fighting for their lives. It's only a matter of time before we ourselves will be directly impacted by it, and no human being likes to face the prospects of suffering and the possibility of death. Perhaps that is why, especially in difficult times, people seek explanations and meaning in what is happening to them. Our current circumstances take me back to a well-known Bible passage, Matthew 24, the context of which has the disciples pointing out to Jesus the temple in Jerusalem. It was the source of national pride, the center of their spiritual life, a magnificent and an invincible building. To their surprise, however, Jesus did not share their excitement. His reply was not only underwhelming, but right down worrying. Jesus told them of a time when those blocks of very hard rock on which the temple stood will no longer provide a haven for them, physically or spiritually. The people who used to find meaning in worshipping there will no longer be able to do so. But more concerning... The world which Jesus described will be plagued by tragedies upon tragedies, some of which are still unimaginable even for us today. However, in the process of describing such difficult times, Jesus worked with an assumption first, and at the same time he gave them two commands. Here is the assumption which permeates every one of these passages and stories. It has God or the master of the house or the groom as is described out of sight for the time being. God remains in control no matter what transpires during this out of sight period and a revealing will happen very soon. And while the world appears to fall apart during this time when God is out of sight, Jesus reassures his followers that God remains in control and he cannot wait to reveal himself. So the assumption that Jesus works with is that God is in control even though he is out of sight and preparing for a revealing very soon. But secondly, he gives two clear instructions, two commands. The first one, keep watch. He says, be alert, watch what is happening, but watch it with understanding. Do not be fooled by charlatans and stand firm in spiritual terms. Keep watch, he says first. Then he says, keep busy. In Matthew 24, verses 45 to 51, Jesus describes the master of a household entrusting the welfare of his servants to a supervisor. Notwithstanding the prevailing circumstances, his task was very clear. 
take care of the needs of those who fall within your sphere of influence. Anyone who concerns themselves with these matters, caring for the needs of others, is deemed a wise and faithful servant. Give them their food at the proper time. Take care of people's basic needs. When a master comes, it will be good if the supervisor will be found to be busy with his God-given task. Two commands, keep watch and be busy. They are emphasized again in the next chapter, Matthew 25, when Jesus shares three illustrations. The first one, the parable of the ten virgins, has to do with the first command, keep watch, because each one of us is personally responsible for our own spirituality. Yes, there is a time of slumber, but yes, we need to fill up our spiritual life with every bit of resource that is available to us. The other two parables in Matthew 25 have to do with the command of keeping busy. The parable of the talents what it has to do with whatever God has given us as gifts, whatever we received from God as gifts, we ought to use them in serving him. And the second parable, the parable of the sheep and the goats, emphasizes again the need to keep busy. They are the ones, the people who are caring for the community, feeding the hungry, giving water to the thirsty, welcoming the strangers, clothing those without clothes, caring for the sick, visiting the prisoners. Keep watch and keep busy. So the assumption again, God is still in control and he will soon reveal himself. And the two commands, keep watch and keep busy. The way I make sense of Jesus' second command, keep busy, is along these lines. There are games out there, whether card games or tile games, where the aim is to finish with no cards in your hands or tiles on your board. I like to play Rami Cup with my family, and whenever we have an opportunity to play, play a game, we do so. The aim of this game is to use the tiles on your board to add to the formations others have already placed on the table, enriching if you want their work. You can use your own tiles to place them on the table for others to add to yours. There is a sense of working together, all the while finishing one's own tiles, investing them into what is available on the table. One could also choose to hold all the tiles on the board and make a big splash towards the end of the game, surprising everyone with their skill. However, a good game is one where every participant works as hard as possible to spend their tiles at the earliest opportunity because in some of these games, whatever you are left holding on your board at the end of the game will be deducted from your points. It will count against your score, hence the need to use it wisely and invest them in the works of others and your own. Likewise is with God's world. We have been given talents and opportunities to live for him and others. When he will be revealed, the wise and faithful servant will be the one who would, who would have spent their God-given time and opportunities by giving busy for God's kingdom invested every talent in the service of God and those around us, given everything away for the sake of the master. No room for hoarders in God's kingdom. Um, I would like to welcome my partners in discussion uh, this morning, uh, Marianne, uh, Karen, and Tihi. Thank you very much for joining us uh, via Zoom, and thank you for being willing to dialogue together on what has just been said. So I would like to open the floor, as it were, to any of you to share some of the insights. Um, what I see here in chapter that you're talking about is that um, certain current narratives about what's going on and why is it going on can be challenged in the light of these words. Uh, first, there is a narrative of God who is absent, a deity God who is disinterested and we are left on our own to struggle and do the best out of the situation. Uh, and then people feel lonely, they feel isolated even more. On the other side, there is a narrative who, of God who is um, angry God who punishes and uses the situation to punish people for their their evil and this re revengeful and arbitrary uh, God who judges us and punishes is actually not not really want, um, opening us up to relate to him in a loving way but rather through fear and panic and mm -hmm. um, 
but these chapters talk about God who is deeply engaged with human history, who does not suppress our agency as human beings, who uh, allows us space for our own activity and response to what he's doing, but God who is engaged in loving relationship. And I think this love is not only the matter of feelings that he loves us and feel warm feelings towards us, but rather covenantal love that he, whatever he started, he's going to finish it. And he is in control of the events. And um, through his providence, he can use human brokenness. He can use all sorts of situations, messy life situations to still work out his will and his purposes. So this is the God that we can actually relate and we can rely on in this period of crisis, not be afraid of, afraid of him, not be in isolation from him, but rather engage and respond to him and share the love and engagement with others also in community, caring communities. Thank you, Tiki. Yes, I think that's really important, the idea that loving, caring communities um, can take away fear. We know that perfect love takes away fear. And um, God's perfect love for us takes away our fear. And then our perfect love for each other can reduce the fear and anxiety at this time. And I think it's really important to focus on the, the being kind, because actually when we are kind to each other, we experience that love and our fear is reduced. And when we are kind together and we, we do things for each other in community, then we have that feeling between ourselves. Um, also, the more kind you are, then the less you're likely to argue. When you're actually in a confined space with your family, that's probably a good thing to do as well. So um, being kind is an excellent way to try and uh, experience God's love and share it wherever we are, whether we're with our family or whether we're on our own, we can find ways to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. No, I think often we, when we get scared, we become passive. Um, and uh, when we become passive, we feel out of control, and then that sort of reinforces a fear and a and a sense of not being able to to make a difference. And I think that sometimes just trying to do something, even though you, it might feel very small and it might feel quite insignificant in the big picture, um, it also sort of puts a sense back to yourself in that you know um, I can do something and 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 I can add value to someone. And one of the things we've seen with the um, in the community is that people are stepping up not just in our church but everywhere you know there are volunteer campaigns i think there was a news article yesterday saying the nhs got 180,000 volunteers in a day i mean this is an amazing time in a sense and and we should all be part of it and you know it's it also gives hope and it, it and it, it inspires you know that humans aren't just evil or selfish or hoarders or materialistic but humans you know they reach out and uh, and so i i guess my point is just don't miss out on this opportunity to get involved to get to know people around you get to know people on your street find out what their needs are um and you can be part of spreading that hope wonderful thank you tiki um I mean, there is no blueprints for situations like this because they are unique historical situations. And what I developed for myself is a certain, like a triangle that I think about. It's like a framework for the situation like this. One, first I look up to see, I look up to see what God is up to, you know. And this requires time, sometimes to stop from activities, like not to be workaholic and just replace one busy way of life with another type of busy life now. But first to stop and face yourself and God and to see what he's up to because he's continually working and we are here to join him yet often we will not have a very precise um, answer uh, in many situations then I look within and I see what God gave me you know my talents and my passions even my brokenness and my weaknesses can be used uh, by God to actually uh, express his strength and uh, my past experiences then the third aspect I look around to see what is the need around so in one quote, to summarize this, it's um, God's calling from you. So top, God's calling for you is where your uh, heart's deepest gladness uh, as well as world's deepest need meet. So somewhere in the middle of this triangle, you find yourself uh, actively engaged in sharing God's love. Thank you. Karen, um, for those of us who are struggling with creativity in terms of being kind, can you help us a little bit? Um, well, start where, you, start where you are. I think actually you can work as a family and make a list of all the things you can do kind for each other in the home. I think that's a really important thing to do right now. We need to make sure that our home's a place of love and peace and joy. 
um, so that everyone feels more safe there before we can actually go out and do anything else. So um, there are some lists actually, the Trans-European Division has a project called Live Kind and you'll see the, the link for that on the screen. Um, and that has actually hundreds of ideas of ways to be kind, including one set of ideas for what you can do when you're stuck at home and uh, ideas for couples <laughs> when they're in the same house, take care of each other. We don't want what therapists are calling um, co-div 20, which is all the divorce rate going up in 2020 because people aren't taking care of each other through COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to see that. So um, do take care of each other, look at those ideas and just be, just start where you are. I think do what you enjoy doing and just do the things around you. Keep your eyes open and see what kind things can you do. Um, in our family, we had a, we used to make hearts, um, cut the hearts out and the kids wrote on it, kindness was here. And we all had like maybe five hearts a day and we had to do five acts of kindness and shove the heart wherever, stick it wherever we'd done the kindness. So people would actually notice the kindness had been done. Um, and that's a great thing you can do at home when you're stuck because it encourages you to get rid of those hearts and do the kind things. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Marianne, let's say somebody has a desire to help. They don't quite know how to go about it. Any practical <laughs> way? Um, well, if you have access to the internet, there are tons and tons of ways that you can get involved. Um, Newbold Church, we have organized ourselves. Um, so there is a link on the Newbold Church Facebook page and the website where you can fill in some different options in ways that you think that you'd be able to help because we know not everyone is able to go out. And well, at the moment, we definitely shouldn't be going out um, and physically meet people. We can, um, you can write a card, you can give someone a phone call, um, you can when you go for your once a day um, sort of exercise outdoor adventure, have a look around, you know, who's home. Um, do, if you know people on your street, put something in their mailbox, maybe check if they're okay. Um, but there are so many ways that people are getting together and actually, you know, talking to each other, maybe more than ever. You know, when you could get home from work, you could be on your phone or you could sit in front of a screen, but I think, suddenly people are definitely connecting and that all adds value. So yes, please go onto the website, sign up to our volunteer program if you want to, and we will reach out to you if something comes up where we think you can help. Um, but also look around, there's lots of else going on in society um, that, that are very well organized as well. So let's not miss this opportunity to help there as well. Um, thank you. I would like to say thank you to all three of you for being part of this discussion. And I hope that um, those who watch this program will find it useful and they would have found some resources which they can use during this um, fairly unique uh, set of circumstances. Thank you and let us continue to pray for one another uh, as we also serve the communities where God has placed us. So an assumption. God is still in control and he will soon reveal himself. And to commands, keep watch and keep busy. May you live with the assurance that the day of his revealing is near, very near. May you know that in spite of the anxiety we experience when witnessing the workings of evil all around us, God is still in control. And may we keep busy spending ourselves in his service and for the sake of others. May we be found with empty boards, fully invested and having exhausted everything he gave us for him and his world. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. I hope that you got some ideas that you can take away, not just for today, but perhaps also tomorrow and the day after and the day after for the rest of the week. And I hope these ideas will make a difference in your life, the way that you see yourself, you see others and how it all fits together. I pray you'll stay well and healthy. I pray you'll stay happy despite the strange circumstances. And I'm looking forward to seeing and hearing how you joined us for worship today and what happens in your life during the week. Don't switch your screens off just yet because there are a couple of announcements that will let you know what can happen next and how you can join us in the future. Hope to see you soon. Happy Sabbath. Despite our physical separation, we are blessed that we can still see each other using technology. We would like to encourage you to take a picture of yourself, your family, as you participate in our worship service this week and send it to the email below. We want to include you in next week's broadcast. We would like to invite you to join us in reflection and prayer starting tomorrow. Sunday 29th of March for 34 days whether on your own in your families or in remotely connected groups let us pray together the link below will provide a daily reading for your reflection we'd like to remain connected as a community so we can support and care for one another despite our physical separation to ensure we include everyone and to help us to communicate effectively, would like to encourage you to add your details to our new online church database. Whether you're a regular church member or have just come into contact with us, if you would like to hear from us, we would love to hear from you. It is easy to register online using the church suite button below and you can share as much or as little information as you would like. All data will be managed in accordance with the GDPR rules. If you cannot register online, please contact us using the office email. Although our church building is closed, our church remains open. The current circumstances provide big challenges and big opportunities. Our church ministries are learning new ways to operate and our community ministries keep reaching out in this time of need. We can only provide these services thanks to your ongoing financial support. Please, therefore, do keep giving your tithes and offerings using any of the eight different ways outlined in the donations button above on our website. If you have any questions about donating at this time, please email us at our office. We are very grateful for your commitment to God and for your generosity.